bringing you North Alabama at its best. I'm Kenesha Dees, and this is the Fox 54 Week in Review for the weekend of February 23rd. Glad, as always, to have you streaming with us on the Fox 54 News app and on fox54.com. Here's what's ahead for you in our program this week. Residents in the Big Cove area are going postal over backlogs in service from their post office. Can anything be done about it? They take that question to their local representatives. And you may have heard about controlled burns, but what's the actual purpose? Our Sedona Meadows goes out with a TVA crew on a mission to burn and save our local wild spaces. And this week's top teacher knows what it's like to be in the hot seat that is the student's chair. She tells us about the struggle that inspired her to be an educator. But we'll start this week as we have all month long with movement in Montgomery, legislation angering some over gender identity and a ruling by the state Supreme Court has in vitro fertility treatments that many parents rely on stopped in its tracks. Three Alabama fertility clinics have paused in vitro fertilization due to legal risks. It's after an embryo ruling by the Alabama Supreme Court last Friday. Today, our Jasmine Bird sat down with a medical director at a local fertility institute to learn more about how or if this ruling will affect the local practice. Um, it, the, by, by ruling that an embryo has the right of a child, it makes it to where it's up in the air you know, what we can do once they are cryopreserved. According to the Associated Press, the Alabama Supreme Court has ruled that frozen embryos can be considered children under state law. A decision critics said could have sweeping implications for fertility treatment in the state. The decision was issued in a pair of wrongful death cases brought by three couples who had frozen embryos destroyed in an accident at a mobile fertility clinic. So the process is we stimulate a woman's eggs. We get as many eggs as we can. If a couple does end up using five embryos and gets three children from it and they have three embryos left or however many, at that point we're left with the question, well, what, what can we do with those? You know, there, there's the option, um, there's several other options, but one of those options is to discard those embryos because we're done with them and they are, are ours, you know, is it ours meaning the patients. And um, th this law sort of ties our hands to that. Fertility Institute of North Alabama Medical Director Brett Davenport believes the Alabama law was written with good intention. And I stand behind it. Um, it just, I, I think if anything, the, the law did not do diligence in, in addressing a detail like this. And I've got high hopes that the legislatures are going to do the right thing and just add an amendment that clarifies this, this in no way ever was intended to apply to IVF embryos. Equating an embryo to a child is scientifically unfounded, and the clinical ramifications of such a legal decision um, are tremendous. And for patients considering IVF, Davenport says don't give up just yet. I would say that this should not change anything at all in that decision. Um, there, there are several different ways to skin the cat, so to speak. In Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. All right, a bill sponsored by State Senator Arthur Orr is making a comeback this legislative session. It was first introduced last year, the primary focus to crack down on residential protest and swatting. It's Senate Bill 57, which would prohibit picketing or protesting near homes with the intent to harass or intimidate. There would be criminal penalties if someone violates this. It would also make swatting or the intentional false report to police of an emergency a crime. We spoke with Orr this afternoon and he shares more. Here's a listen. It's not to take away First Amendment rights to peaceably assemble or anything like that. They can do that at the courthouse square or parks or wherever. But when you start going into neighborhoods and creating a real concern for the not just the, the um, targeted individual or their family, but also for the neighbors themselves, uh, that's something I think we can put some guardrails on. Or also shared when the bill was in session last year, it did pass the Senate and move to the House committee, but legislation ran out of time to get it passed. Brother of Steve Perkins lobbying for new body camera legislation after Steve's death back in September. Nicholas Perkins traveled to Montgomery this morning to voice his support for Senate Bill 14, also coined as the Steve Perkins Act. Under current Alabama law, body camera footage is only released to those whose image or voice is in the recording. 
The Steve Perkins Act would revise this law, making it where body camera footage would be made public record. It would also require that the video be released within 30 days of a request. We talked with Perkins, who shared more about his support for this bill. This situation happens a lot, uh, not just in this state, but all over the country. So what we are trying to accomplish with this bill is to make sure that families have access to it, uh, not just families, but the public also, um, so that they can see what happens to their loved one um, in um, a situation of this magnitude. And too many times in the past, this has happened with police involved shootings. And in a lot of cases, uh, the families have been lied to. They've been given a false narrative. That's what we're trying to prevent here. We're trying to create transparency between families, communities, and police departments. Well, the bill's sponsor is State Senator Marika Coleman, a Jefferson County Democrat. Where a controversial bill was amended, adopted, and passed over to the Senate floor. We're talking about Senate Bill 92. The bill's sponsor, State Senator April Weaver, says the bill will define sex and gender as not the same and define sex-based terms. The bill requires that sex be reported at birth as male or female. Several were in attendance for public comment this afternoon as those in favor and against the bill shared their thoughts. Take a listen. You're all reducing a community of people down to the sex acts that you imagine them performing and robbing that community of its humanity. When the state robs a group of people of their humanity for any reason, including who they love, that is history. In fact, it would be a stain on the history of the state of Alabama. I'm not here to deny anybody the right to identify however they want, but I'm telling you it's important that we identify truth historically. I mean, I even feel that we're crazy to be here to define what is a man, what is a woman. Senator Linda Coleman Madison described the bill as a, quote, sad day for Alabama, while other community members shared that the bill would help protect women. We'll continue to keep you updated as the bill moves forward. Two people are in custody after authorities say one of those suspects shot at a deputy who attempted to pull them over. They say it was because a tag was not registered to the vehicle. Arkin McCoy was on the scene and has the story. Suspicious he was originally just trying to talk to him at the hotel before he could get out. They jumped in the car and took off. Earlier today, an initial stop to talk to an individual due to a switch tag at the King's Inn Hotel off of South Memorial Parkway led police to a field off of Hobbs Island Road and two subjects in custody. Chief Deputy of the Madison County Sheriff's Office, Stacy Bates, explains how this all began. Basically what we had was a, a deputy with the Sheriff's Office attempted a traffic stop on a car. Uh, we know it at least had a switch tag. Possibly when you got those, it's you know suspicion always is it stolen or what's going on. A lot of times, stolen cars they'll switch the tags also, so you never really know when you've got a switch tag. Is it just someone who hasn't bought a tag, or is it a stolen car and they've taken the tag off of it? Uh, when he tried to stop them, they took off shortly after the pursuit started. There was a sh at least one shot fired from inside the offender vehicle towards our deputy. Uh, the pursuit continued down to where you see it behind us. It came to rest in the field back here probably stuck more than likely. Uh, at that point, they jumped out on foot. It's a male and a female. Took off running, but we have both in custody at this point. I don't have names for you right now. We're waiting to verify that, and I don't have the exact charges. Bates also explains where they go from here. We're going to try to figure out what's going on with the car, why they ran to begin with, uh, what was their thought process, why were they running, what's so bad that you're going to fire a shot at a law enforcement officer. And so at the end of the day, we're out to protect the public, and that's the kind of person that our job is to protect the public from. So those people at the end of the day, the only way I know to put it is they need to go to jail. For Fox 54 News, I'm Ken McCoy. Well, aspiring nurses now have a new option for obtaining their licenses. It's thanks to a partnership between Wallace State Community College and Athens State University. This means students from either school can get both their associates and bachelor's degrees and attend the location most convenient for them. The Wallace State Nursing Program Chair says the partnership is a step toward filling a critical need for nurses in North Alabama. These students will be prepared at a higher level to assume management positions and leadership jobs, as well as be able to enter into graduate school. There is a great need for nurses in Alabama, and especially for baccalaureate prepared nurses. 
All right, well, students in the joint enrollment program will apply to both colleges' nursing programs. If you want to get a jump start on that, applications for the fall semester opens up March 15th. The Morgan County DA's office has teamed up with Decatur City Schools and local groups to launch a new crime prevention initiative with a focus on families. Our Sedona Meadows tells us more on what this new program is about. Here at the Morgan County Courthouse, District Attorney Scott Anderson announced a new program his office will be leading alongside 23 local agencies. It's known as the Helping Families Initiative, or HFI. On its surface, it's a crime prevention program, but it's a whole lot more than that. And it starts with helping students. If we can intersect with that child and take that child off the bad path and put them on the good path, then this program has paid for itself hundreds of times over. The DA's office is working closely with Decatur City Schools to address both truancy and children's misbehaviors in the classroom. The U.S. Department of Justice says truancy is a stepping stone to delinquent and criminal activity. So how will HFI address these issues? Well, Decatur City Schools will notify the DA's office if any student reaches three unexcused absences. When we get that information, we're going to write a letter to uh, that, that child's uh, parent or guardian. We're going to tell them, look, we've noticed that uh, your child has three unexcused absences and we, we want you to address the issue. We're here to help if we can. Uh, but what we don't want to happen is for you and your child to end up in uh, truancy juvenile court. Now, addressing a child's behavior will be a bit more complex. Children who are referred by the school system for their misbehavior will be evaluated by the DA's office. We may do that by an in-office visit, a phone call, a Zoom meeting. And for more serious cases, they'll do a home study where they'll gather information about the student's home environment. That information will then be presented to that team of 23 different organizations. Morgan County Juvenile Probation Office, Mental Health Association in Morgan County, Riverside Counseling and Consulting, First Priority. Just to name a few. The idea is to collectively address different issues a student may be facing and connect them with helpful resources. It has uh, the potential to not only impact that child, but their families as well, and even neighborhoods. Attorney Anderson says after they see how the initiative is working in Decatur City Schools, they'll soon partner with Hartzell City and Morgan County School Systems. Indicator, Sedona Meadows, Fox 54 News. Now, Fox 54 Top Teacher, sponsored by Calhoun Community College. I'm excited to introduce this teacher. Sure, she goes the extra mile for her students inside and outside the classroom, but she was once a student who struggled, and now she's in a position to help struggling students. Meet Susan Beatty from St. John the Baptist Catholic School in Madison. Think about your answer. One, two, three, or four. One, two, three, or four. For Susan four. Beatty. Close your eyes. This is year three as a teacher and year oh, two at St. John the Baptist answer. Catholic School, teaching fourth graders. We're going to highlight as Catholics, we pray and see. I've already done third grade, so that kind of already helped me see what they knew when they were coming into fourth. So that way I could grow on that and make it um, even better and stronger so they'll be ready for fifth grade and then of course off to middle school. Beatty believes her purpose is education because of her personal testimony. From a very small young age, I really struggled academically and so I learned the importance of really working hard and I had a bunch of friends that helped tutor me. Beatty says she's a bit creative in the classroom to better connect with her students. I tried to make sure I um, learn each child um, based off of their needs, so by connecting through them, so what are their interests is where I usually start off from. Uh, maybe it might be sports or it might be theater and that kind of thing. Her principal, Sherry Lewis, says Beatty bridges the gap inside and outside the classroom. We speak a lot about homeschool partnership here at St. John's because we feel like it takes both home and school working together to raise our children today. Miss Beatty does that every single day. She puts in long hours. She goes the extra mile for her children, her students. Beatty with this message for students and teachers. It doesn't matter how you are academically, academically if you are the slowest one in the school, don't don't worry about that. That was me and look at where I am today. 
Congratulations, Mrs. Beatty. Well deserved. And we are always looking for deserving teachers like her. Nominate one at fox 54com Prom season is upon us, and some students are excited to pick out their outfits for the big dance, but other kids may see this as a financial barrier. One local nonprofit, The Caring Link, is providing free prom dresses to students in Madison County through its pop-up prom shops. It's full of different styles and sizes, along with jewelry and door prizes. We know that prom is such a special milestone for a lot of children, a lot of girls and teenagers, and so we wanted to make sure that we provided them with the clothing that they needed so that they didn't miss out on this opportunity to have fun and mark this special occasion just based on a need. Wow, what a way to give back. Well, the Caring Link is helping four different high schools in Madison County this year with the hope to expand next year. They're always welcoming formal dress donations and are excited to continue building up students' confidence. We have about 36,000 pounds of food that we're giving out to the community. One Generation Away operates a drive through mobile pantry in various parking lots throughout North Alabama, Middle Tennessee, and the Florida Panhandle nearly every Saturday. Today, the mobile food pantry set up at Discovery Middle School, giving back to the Madison community. And according to One Gen Away's Alabama Regional Manager, Lindsey Lee, in Madison County alone, there are a lot of people who live in poverty. We have about 270 cars here right now um, and a full entire grocery cart lasts about two weeks for a family of four. Fruits and vegetables and produce and the canned goods seem to be what everybody is needing the most around here. River Valley Church and lead pastor Daniel Dean were one of today's event sponsors serving the Huntsville Madison community for about four years now. Uh, a lot of the members here from River Valley Church, we got people here from Building Church, people here from Asbury, uh, all coming together as one to, to serve our area. And that, that's what it's about, people coming together and loving everybody. And most importantly, Dean believes their mission is to make sure no one in the community feels or walks alone. We don't want people to think there's no hope. Uh, we want people to know that there's somebody here for them. Uh, whether, no matter the church, no matter the denomination, no matter the organization, uh, we just want people to know that people are here for them in their corner and we want to see them make it through whatever battle, whatever storm that they're facing. Today is also the first giveaway under Lee's supervision that food items weren't the only thing distributed, but blankets and socks were also provided. And we just want to bless people and like I said, no judgment anywhere. In Madison, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. Billboard recently presented the Orion Amphitheater with a huge honor. It's pretty amazing. I mean, Billboard, obviously a global recognized music industry standard, um, independently came to us and said, our editorial board has selected the top 26 venues in the world, and you're one of them. Awesome. And it, it just came out of nowhere, and it's, it's quite an honor. We're not even two years old. Yeah. Here we are in North Alabama. We get called the top amphitheater in the entire East Coast of the United States, and we're not even on the East Coast. As we wrapped up 2023, we learned that tourism played a big role in Huntsville's economy. Quality of life uh, really uh, resonates well with our visitors. So whenever they come into town, they get to see and do the same things that, that we get to enjoy as resident. The Orion has, has really bumped up um, our uh, level. Uh, they had, they recently announced they had over uh, 250 or right at 250,000 people that went to their concerts and activities. So that type of impact is uh, significant. Uh, some, uh, probably the majority were from this area, but a lot were not. And part of that influx of guests showed up as ticket sales for the Orion. Speaking of hungry, even out of towners are hungry for it because a lot of your ticket sales last year came from people from out of town. How does that all play into what you guys are doing here? Yeah, it's pretty amazing to see the statistics and see, wow, people are driving and flying and staying the night and eating. And we're looking at the economics and the experience around just one weekend of concerts. Mm -hmm. It's phenomenal to see. There was people coming from all over the world last year. And, you know, the states were coming and it's just pretty amazing to see people are day tripping from Nashville, from Memphis, from Atlanta. But yeah, we've become a destination and a really proud element in the Huntsville community. Awesome. What do you see the amphitheater going in the future? 
I mean, I think the, the goal has always been, like, we want to be one of the top venues in the world, right? So to get this ranking feels like, wow, we're hitting it. We want to be that. We want to be like Red Rocks or The Gorge or these Hollywood Bowl. We want to be set in the same breath. So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we're just that iconic venue, and we happen to be in Huntsville, Alabama, which is pretty exciting. For Fox 54 News, I'm Ken McCoy. Construction is everywhere around the Rocket City and the noise for some of us can make it hard to enjoy a little quiet time with nature. Our Ken McCoy spoke with Land Trust on the issue and has the story. Enjoying your favorite nature trail can be a peaceful experience until it's interrupted by sounds of ongoing construction. In a Reddit post, one user in part wrote one trail they used, quote, it used to be this cute little nature trail surrounded by nature. Now there are houses on one side, forests being clear cut on the other side, and rumbling of construction equipment. We always have um, folks that are um, upset or discouraged whenever there's development and it's near a nature preserve. Yep. Um, or even if it's a property that they've gone to for years and just enjoyed that's um, not a nature preserve, it's just open land and they see it being, you know, developed. Um, but that's just kind of like a reinforcement of why the land trust exists. Right. I mean, it's all about balancing the growth with the natural area. So the, the, the key is to be able to conserve the areas that need to be conserved, that have the special species or flora and fauna, or their near neighborhoods where people can access them, um, while at the same time allowing for that economic development and growth that we you know, also need. And despite the noise, people are still out enjoying the trails. The city has several miles now on greenways, and every time a developer uh, comes into the city, they're like, you know, how do I get connected? to the Greenway, um, or now the Singing River Trail is up and running in the community. Like, how do we get on the route of the Singing River Trail? Uh, they've realized that it's an amenity. You know how golf courses used to be the thing? Well, now it's trails. And so um, any anytime anybody's looking for a home, they want to know, where's the trail network? You know, how do I get, you know, how do I get to the Greenway? And it has a lot to do with, you know, how people receive that neighborhood. So, yeah, everybody loves them. It's been great. Right. A Huntsville City Schools Board member has now been cleared by the Alabama Ethics Commission of any alleged wrongdoing. The district announced today the commission cleared school board president Ryan Renaud on a complaint filed by a former district employee. If you recall, back in December, the complaint alleged that Renaud should not have voted to change the nepotism policy that apparently would have benefited him. The Ethics Commission sharing that complaint against Renaud, quote, did not constitute a violation of the Ethics Act. Therefore, no investigation was initiated and the case has been closed, end quote. Right, Alabama and m University is taking the initiative to uplift its young men with a program called Kings on the Hill. This community building opportunity empowers young black men on campus through activities and conversations. Today's conversation featured actor Lorenz Tate. Our Jasmine Bird takes us to the Knight Center for all the action. The one thing I am excited for is that we get to come together, learn every year. Alabama A&M University celebrates Male Initiative Week, Kings on the Hill. Isaiah Hewley is a sophomore at AAMU and shares why this week is so special to him. It is truly special to me that it is during Black History Month that we get to celebrate males. We get to learn more about the black history and where the males really started to play a big part for us today. Also that um, for this week, it is my birthday week, so celebrating it with males that I looked up to compared to my freshman year does play a big part. AAMU senior Christian Imonina believes this week is also all about paying it forward. That's why we have uh, things like this, to show people that there is a community of people that are uh, willing to help, that are willing to show them the way, they're willing to give them the example, because without that help, you really aren't anything. AAMU Director of Student Activities Jessica Brown says making sure their young black male students understand that they are needed in this community is key. They have a presence. Um, there's a need for them. And so we want to make sure that we uplift and empower them, let them know what they can do and, and that they can um, reach their goals that they have set for themselves. Actor Lorenz Tate spoke to students about his acting career, offering advice on life lessons he's learned along his journey. No one's going to say black men except black men. No one's going to say black women except black women. 
Tate also leaves a final message. It's okay for the challenge. It's okay for us to want to elevate. In Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54. Your mail late once in a while is a common occurrence, but imagine on top of that getting those packages wet or sometimes not even at all. Residents of Big Cove are seeking change when it comes to mail service, and Arkin McCoy has the story. This is a video of the Owens Crossroads mail out in the rain. Sometimes when things don't add up, a little investigation is necessary. Work every day. But one day I went down to the post office and I was no place to park. And I was extremely surprised that the employees were out in the parking lot working. And I just kept my eye on it and they worked in the rain. They worked in uh, some sleet and snow. I think a lot of employees might have left because they didn't like the circumstances. So when I started investigating, it was evident it was too small a post office for this area. Carol and other residents of the Big Cove area says the issue with the post office is not new. It's been the same for quite a while. And when I did talk uh, with the assistant postmaster, he said they were looking for another space. But they had been doing that for quite some time, and it just didn't seem to be going anywhere. And given our group and the things that we want to do, uh, which is infrastructure, we decided to start with this one. This is unconscionable. Tonight, the Cove Area Citizens Action Group, along with local government representatives, joined together to voice their concerns about adding a new post office to the area. Councilman David Little was one of the representatives on hand to hear concerns. It's obviously been something that folks have wanted for a while, and uh, ultimately it's a federal decision, uh, federal funding, so uh, involving Congressman Strong's office I think will be important, and I know the city would love to have a post office out here. And Representative Dale Strong is also doing his part to see change in the area. Well, um, my understanding is that uh, Dale Strong's office has already written a letter to the postmaster, so that's a good sign. But like I said, we definitely want a um, new post office. Councilman Lillard and I continued our discussion on other projects going on in the area, like the widening of Old Big Cove Road. When you think of the Tennessee Valley Authority or TVA, you may just think of electricity, but a big part of what they do is work with the environment. Our Sedona Meadows takes us to Gunnersville where they're lighting prescribed fires. Here near Gunnersville Dam, things are burning up, but it's all for a reason. It's to help the plants and wildlife that live here. TVA alongside the Alabama Forestry Commission is doing what's called a prescribed burn or a controlled fire right here on portions of TVA's public land. We've got a lot of areas that we try to maintain as early successional or, or open habitat. There's a lot of uh, wildlife and, and plant species that depend on this type of habitat. And we use fire as a tool to, to maintain that rather than bush hogging or mowing. This is a more natural uh, way to do that. Josh Burnett, a senior specialist for TVA's natural resources, explains burning these areas removes any plants not adapted to fire while allowing native grass to thrive. As a natural resource manager, I mean, what I try to do is restore areas back to what they were historically. By doing small prescribed burns under certain weather conditions, your fuel does not build up. Uh, every time you burn, you're removing those leaves, you're removing those needles or those grasses, and the fuel doesn't build up. So when you do get a fire in the area, it's not a big intense fire. And although these flames may look large, it's all controlled with safety as a top priority. We light it in a way that the animals are not trapped inside and they have plenty of opportunities to escape. They also work with fire breaks like roads or rivers while paying attention to the weather like the temperature and humidity. Once we've gotten that area kind of the fire back in a little bit, then we can start to, to light it in different ways using the wind to our advantage or uh, just whatever we need to do to meet the objective of the burn. Burnett says a week or two after these burns happen. You will not even know there was a burn here. There will be fresh green sprouts everywhere. And, uh, and that, that's habitat that wildlife really depends on. It gives them areas to feed, to, to raise their young. TVA plans to continue these prescribed burns on several acres of public lands in North Alabama through March. In Marshall County, Sedona Meadows, Fox 54 News. 
A new port is heading to the River City and it's expected to improve traffic flow, removing more than 14,000 tractor trailers on the interstate. Decatur Mayor Tad Bowling breaks down the timeline of how soon this change can be expected. We all want less traffic on the interstate as we make our way to the beach or trying to make our way to Montgomery. And Decatur Mayor Tab Bowling is introducing a possible solution in the works. We were contacted by the Port of Mobile, uh, the director there, and uh, about a memorandum of understanding between the port and CSX, the railway. Mayor Bowling says it's all about two specific things. It's all about that port being here and being able to get goods in and out and taking traffic off the interstate. The product will come into the port from Central America, South America, Asia, and soon Mexico. And from there, it will load uh, onto a CSX rail and ultimately make its way to a customer here in North Alabama uh, within two to three days, no more than three days. So that's really, uh, that's amazing. Now, that's over... That's over the, a five-year period, so we're, we're uh, looking at about a two-year period before the port's actually open. During Monday night's Decatur City Council meeting, the number one concern for one resident, noise. Um, if you guys could, when you're having those conversations, advocate for the whole city to maybe try to be like the quiet zone where they could put those extended rail arms in. I mean, with all the neighborhoods going up and stuff, they would be a selling point actually to the city, to res residents to move in, knowing that they're not. That's a good thought. That's a really good thought. Mayor Bowling says this concern is something they are aware of. That is something that's been mentioned, and uh, we'll certainly discuss that with CSX. Indicator, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. And while our eyes are on the sky, to our friends who travel, are you ready to be LA bound this summer? Well, the Huntsville International Airport announced today that Breeze Airlines will offer a new non-stop route from Huntsville to LAX beginning mid-June. The new route expected to operate twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays with ticket prices starting at just $129. We spoke with spokesperson Mary Swanstrom, who shared why the airport added this new flight. We're seeing compared to 2023, which was a record passenger traffic year for Huntsville International, the airlines have added 14% more seats than last year and 19% more flights that are available for passengers this year. This tells us that they're investing in the growth that we're seeing uh, from our community as our community supports their local airport. All right, and passengers will get to fly on Breeze's brand new Airbus for this new route. Now, a quick programming note, we'll take next week off so that we'll bring you replays of our Black History Month special, but the Week in Review will be back March 8th with more local coverage, and this includes the results of the Alabama primaries. Remember, that'll be on March 5th, so do not forget to go out and vote. Between now and then, have the Fox 54 app handy for breaking news and weather wherever you go. For all of us at Fox 54 News, I'm Kenesha Dees. Have a great weekend.